Welcome to today's webinar, everyone. I'm Lisa Silverman, and we're here for getting started with policy and procedure writing. We know some of you are coming to your act because you're thinking about accreditation. You're maybe just at that point of we're sort of thinking about it, or we've been through it once, but we want to get some tips for going through it again. Um, I'm going to open up this webinar with the coffee up that says we are here today just to kind of give you the basics of what are good organizational, what makes for good organizational policies and procedures. It's going to be very little that's your ex specific. Um, as you know, we don't offer consulting, um, but we want to make sure that you're best prepared should you be ready to go through our accreditation process. I also want to acknowledge that I saw the registration list and we know some of you and I can see some of you in the chat box are our current clients. So um, you've been through this before. Maybe you'll have some best practices to share along the way. Maybe you're willing to connect with somebody. Um, as you're doing, you all are awesome. You're replying to everybody in the chat box telling us who you are and where you're from. So welcome. I'm joined today by the amazing URAC team here. First, you're going to hear from Jeff Wusso. He's one of our business development executives. Then you're going to hear from Jen Richards. Jen Richards is a um, former pharmacy reviewer for us, now spends her time mostly on the product development team, a little bit still in the pharmacy review space. You're going to hear from Michelle Corzine. Michelle is one of our pharmacy reviewers, and she's actually come out of a specialty physician practicing, dispensing, doing pharmacy work. And you see my picture up there, and it's nice to be with all of you. Got a very full plan for today. We're going to talk, we're going to welcome you, we're going to tell you a little bit about your act for those of you who are new. We're going to talk about why we have policies and procedures, what they do for an organization, how you want to train your staff on them. We're going to give you some tips and hints. And at the end, we're going to give you just a few tips that we see specific to your act. Um, question and answer is at the bottom right, but it's really not at the bottom right. It's really throughout the webinar. Jeff, the floor is yours to tell us a little bit about your act. Perfect. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Jeff Wusso. I'm one of your act's business development team members. I joined your act in 2021. And I have national responsibility as the business development executive for the majority of your ex pharmacy programs, including mail service, pharmacy benefit management, infusion pharmacy, specialty pharmacy for small businesses, and community pharmacy. And my role today is to tell you about who we are and why we believe in accreditation. URAC is more than 30 years old. We're an independent accreditor, and we do not provide consulting services. We believe that you don't need us to tell you what policy or procedure is best for your organization. But today we're here to help you understand the basics of policies and procedures so you can be better prepared to apply for accreditation. We pride ourselves on keeping the accreditation process fair and completely free of bias. Our reviewers, some of whom you meet during this webinar, are all clinicians themselves and average 20 years of experience in healthcare. The majority of our reviewers have been with URAC at least five years and are experts in our programs and understand what contributes to high quality healthcare. Our clients represent many types and sizes of organizations from virtual health startups to large pharmacies. We also have many clients from utilization management, independent review organizations, and population health whose work matters more now than ever. Next slide, please. Here are the names and logos of just a few of our clients. You may recognize some of them, but others are just like some of the smaller organizations attending this webinar. We're proud to offer accreditations and certifications to organizations that have less than 10 staff members and to organizations that have tens of thousands of employees. Next slide. One of the hallmarks of the URAC accreditation process is the support we proudly provide our clients. You'll have both a client relations manager and an experienced accreditation reviewer assigned to your account. We'll also provide you with access to your program's specific accreditation guide, a guide to using a credit net, your ACTS accreditation application software, and access to your ACTS client information hub. Next slide. We try to make our accreditation process easy to understand. After you submit your application information, your URAC assigned reviewer will start a desktop review of the application, following up with a request for information if necessary. A validation review will also be scheduled. Once the validation review is complete, your reviewer will submit your blinded application to your ex accreditation committee for final determination. Your ex accreditation committee meets twice a month and we notify applicants within 14 to 45 days of the committee decision. If you have any questions about the accreditation process during the webinar, 
feel free to type them into the chat box and one of our team members will answer them. Thanks again for being with us today. I'll leave my contact information in the chat box. Feel free to reach out to me with any questions about starting the accreditation process. Here's Jen to talk about the importance of policies and procedures. Awesome, thank you, Jeff. Um, so I wanted to start out by highlighting the importance of policies and procedures. Um, so policies and procedures are not only important to URAC, they are required by URAC to demonstrate compliance with standards, but really there's a very big broad reason to have policies and procedures. Um, they're not only used by URAC, but also by your employees and consultants and could possibly even help you out with regulators externally. Um, you may be able to demonstrate your compliance with certain regulatory requirements. Um, you may be providing clarity. Uh, you're standardizing your procedures, making sure that your uh, workers and your employees know the rules of conduct, really protecting your business interests as well. Uh, there are many references discussing why policies and procedures are important. I'm sure if you guys wanted to, you could Google search or web search any number of um, policy and procedure websites, and they would tell you why they're important. But regardless of your organization type and size, having policies and procedures are crucial to success, to really making sure that you as an organization um, are running smoothly. Next slide. So when you're looking at the definitions of what are policies and what are procedures, again, you can web search this and there are a multitude of definitions. Um, I pulled in, we pulled in this definition more just from a perspective of um, giving you guys something to hold on to from the start. Now, policies and pr procedures can be much more broad than this specifically, um, but really we, we pulled it together as more of a goals focused uh, policy and procedure, but there may be other reasons why you're writing policies and procedures. Um, so as you can see, business dictionary is where we pulled this from. They defined policies and procedures within the scope of goals and using goals as their base. Um, so in this policies are policies really define the goals and procedures are going to tell you how to get there. So you're going to want to start by defining the outcome you wish to achieve. So this is going to be your goal. That's where you're starting from for each policy and procedure that you're writing. It's going to be anything from, you know, we want to ensure patients have access to name a service or we want to have a plan for ensuring we are able to continue our business during an emergency or any, any number of goals you wish to achieve from that policy. And then the procedure is going to highlight what is needed to get there. Next slide. So for every step outlined in your procedure, you should be getting closer and closer to your stated goal or stance. So your policy statement. Um, so your policy statement sticks with you the entire time throughout your entire policy or it, throughout your entire procedure. Your policy is what's driving that. That overarching goal is where you want to be. So let's look at some examples of policy statements and procedures. Um, again, they, these are just examples you can go find some more on the website or on the, on the internet. Um, they, there's many, many, many out there. Um, some of these are, are somewhat related to standards, but they are not defining standards or meeting the intent of standards. Um, so the organization will provide all members with necessary training, immunizations, and PPE needed for protection from communicable diseases. That's your policy statement. That's what you wanna do from this from this document, this policy and procedure that you're writing. Your procedure may be headquarters will mail a box of supplies to remote staff every other month with masks, gloves, and hand sanitizer. Again, not related to a specific standard, just kind of overarching ideas um, that we, we pulled together here. You can also see under policies, 
the we will meet the special needs of persons who are deaf blind, deaf blind or hard of hearing. Um, team members will submit a request for patient materials to be created with options for large print braille or screen readers to the marketing team. Again, this is how your policy statement is going to drive your procedure. The procedures are more of the steps you take to reach that overarching goal. So we've gone through kind of the importance of policies and procedures. I want to move into some benefits and there are some overlaps here. Um, obviously, why you do policies and procedures, the actual importance of them also can lead to some really good benefits for your organization. So, you know, defining your organizational stance on something, making sure that you're telling your employees and your staff members what the expectations are and what they need to do to achieve those expectations. You can also control some outcomes through a defined process. You know, if you follow the same steps every single time, hopefully you'll get the same results every single time. Um, it could even make your training easier, making sure that all of your employees are, are looking at the same exact document with the same exact steps so that they're consistently doing the same exact thing. And then, of course, we talked a little bit about managing risk, um, and that can definitely be a benefit of policies and procedures. So getting into development. Um, so the first thing I want to say is, you know, look for a template or try to find a template or create a template. Um, anything that you can use as a base for all of your policies and procedures, UREC does not provide a template. We think that your policies and procedures and the templates that you use should be relevant to you and should help you get to where you, you would like to be as an organization. Um, if you do a web search for policy and procedure templates, you will find some. There are plenty out there. Um, and in addition, I, I believe Word has a, a template. There's lots of different templates out there. Um, use one that makes sense for your organization and that will help you document consistently across all of your policies and procedures. Um, so stick with one template. Um, include your organization's name and or logo. Make sure they're yours. Don't take somebody else's policies and procedures and just pretend they're yours. Use, make sure that they're yours. Um, if you are gonna use a template from a consultant where the policies and procedures are mostly filled out, again, make sure that they're yours. Understand every word in the document, make sure it accurately reflects your practices, make sure that they are your policies and processes for procedures. Um, your standards do require consistent documentation. We'll get into our standards at the very, very end. Um, and really our standards are just a broad requirement for you to have policies and procedures and document specifically um, and consistently. Uh, but otherwise the, you know, the templates and what order you document and how you document, where you document, all of those things are things you need to figure out as an organization to make sure that you're consistent, but also that it works for you and you're, you're able to do those things for yourself. Um, we do require that dates be documented as well as the approval authority. Um, and we'll go through that a little bit later. This can be on the policy and procedure itself, on a master list, in a knowledge management system, or really any formal way of documenting. Um, the one that I do want to call out here is the numbering and naming conventions. So make sure that you, as an organization, um, develop a system for how you're going to number and name your documents so that you can find them easily, so that you can reference them easily, and so that you know what each one means or should mean up front. Jen, I'm going to chime in here just to give your voice a little bit of a break there. Um, but I think that numbering and naming is something so important to establish early on um, and to get it right, because it's really hard to change once you have things in place, because so many things are dependent on that system. So really putting careful thought into what works into a little bit of like, how many are we going to have that potentially have that same name? And is there something we need to do about it? What's going to 
The last thing you want is to have confusing policies and procedures. Nobody in an organization likes confusion. So if we can avoid that in some of the naming early on, let's do that. Okay. Um, so moving into kind of the body of the policy and procedure. Um, so this is more of the content. So the previous was very template driven. That's you finding your template and find and making sure that you're consistently documenting the same way every time. This is gonna be, what are you putting into that body? Um, what are some of the things that you need to consider when you are writing the policy and procedure? So the first is the title. I mean, you know, you want your, your title to accurately reflect what that policy and procedure is, um, not just for us at URAC, for sure, not just for us, but for your staff. You don't want them searching for a policy and procedure too long <laughs> just to be able to do their job. Um, give a number to the policy and procedure. Again, this goes back to your naming convention. Make sure that you're documenting that. Make sure that you have some sort of naming and numbering convention and then decide where does this policy fall within that and how are you going to name and number. Um, create a uh, you know, policy or purpose statement. Again, this is maybe your goal, your um, overarching stance, whatever, however you want to call it, whatever you want to make sure whatever you want to call it make sure that it's the you know that statement that's what is this policy what are we trying to do here um, you may want to define the scopes and responsibilities sometimes this is relevant to all employees sometimes it's very subsect group of people um, sometimes the responsibilities of um, you know one group over another group might need to be called out within that policy and procedure. Um, really, this is about just making sure that that policy and procedure is complete and that people know what is expected of them from that policy and procedure. And then the step-by-step -step process on how employees should go about doing whatever, um, whatever they need to do to achieve that goal or that stance making sure that we're, you're consistently doing the same steps over and over again so that you get that same outcome. Next slide. So a few additional things that you may wanna consider in a policy and procedure, um, this may go into your template as just a section that you have open, or you may just add it as needed within each policy and procedure completely up to you. Um, you know, you may want to include a section for any reference materials if you have an SOP or a workflow or anything else that helps you um, with that policy and procedure or helps your employees understand what they need to do with that policy and procedure. Um, you may want to outline any laws or regulations that apply, especially if you're a very law-driven industry sector, you may want to include that in there. Um, any external resources, is there something that you consistently reference as you're either developing or using the policy and procedure? Maybe that's something you want to include. Um, and then maybe a definition section as well. Uh, this is really important, especially if you're using a unique terminology or it's terminology very specific to your organization or you're using acronyms or abbreviations um, in order for all of your employees, especially your new employees who are just coming on, um, in order for them to really be able to use that policy and procedure effectively, you may need a definition section possibly. So the master list, um, having a master list is not necessarily required. Um, it, it may be helpful. And a lot of times it is going to be helpful. So this is going to help you manage your policy and procedure documentation. Um, so the, you know, the, the categories that we, we like to look at or we would recommend that you look at um, to include on your master list, uh, your policy name, if there's a policy number, um, dates, effective dates, review dates, person responsible for approval. Um, it can be a way to manage a lot of this information to make sure that you are staying on top of your policies and procedures. 
Um, like for example, using something that will help trigger uh, the next review or those kinds of um, either knowledge management systems or Excel spreadsheets or anything else that you're using to um, pull all of your policies and procedures together. Um, this, you know, that's considered a master list and that's just to help you kind of control those policies and procedures and make sure that you're continuously keeping up with them. It can also, oh, sorry, go back one slide, please. <laughs> um, so it can also just as a, a high level, um, this may be a way that you can help your employees really kind of understand and know how to access and where to find their policies and procedures. Um, so if you're using a knowledge management system, if you're using a cell spreadsheet, if you're using any sort of documentation of a list, a master list, that may be something that really helps serve as a reference point for everyone so that they know what's out there and they know kind of where to find the policy that may be relevant to what they're looking for. Jen, we had a question come up in the chat box here, and, and this is, I think, up to every organization as always, um, but should a master list contain all revision dates or just the latest revision dates, um, or is there something in between? Yeah, and, you know, really from a, from your ex perspective, it depends on which standard you're under um, where this falls. So we'll talk a little bit more about the standard itself at the very end. Um, and, and ideally your master list is helping you. <laughs> so, um, you know, in the end, the, the review dates, the effective dates, all of those dates that, um, are on your, if you're putting them on your master list, um, you know, they really should help you. So they should help you identify when was your last review date or did you do it annually if that's your policy or every 36 months or every, you know, 18 months if that's your policy. Um, it, it should really help you understand, number one, are you following your policies and procedures? And number two, you know, what, what else do you need to do or where are you at? Thanks, Jen. And, and again, as we're saying here with the continuous UREC message, um, and for those of you who've been through the accreditation process, we hope this has been helpful to you, is that we're not prescriptive with how you do things. We want to see that you're doing them and that you're doing them to meet the intent of the standard. That's why we're not saying it has to include. We can say this is the best practice. That's why we're saying leave it so that it works for you. Um, and you saw if you're in the chat box, Heather invited, um, she asked organizations to share. Um, do you have certain things that work for you? We know that we have a bunch of our accredited clients on here. Maybe if they're willing to share their stories for some of you who are just starting the process, that's up to them as always. Um, but again, you want something that works for your organization. And we say that's really unique about your act is that we're looking for what works for your organization, not what works for the pharmacy next door or the telehealth organization that's one city over. We want it to work for you because that's what's going to make you the best healthcare organization you can be. Jen, I think you've got one more slide and then we turn it over to Michelle. Yes. Um, so the last slide that I want to go over with you guys or the last concept really is relevancy. Um, so in the end, your policies and procedures need to be relevant to you and what you're trying to achieve from that policy and procedure. So policies and procedures do not need to control every employee action. Um, you know, if, if some, you know, if you have a policy and procedure on, um, you know, with, on making sure that you have a business continuity test and all of that, the actual steps of how you're going to correct any issues that arise may not need to be in a policy and procedure because that may be dependent on the situation and what's happening at that time. Um, so not every single step needs to, or you don't need to control every single action that happens to achieve similar outcomes. Um, not every policy and procedure is going to be relevant to every employee. Make sure that you're kind of identifying who needs to, to follow that policy and procedure. It may not be everyone within an organization follows every single policy and procedure. 
Um, and then check your process for relevancy as well. Um, you know, really does that step help you achieve the overarching outcome that you're looking for? Um, so if every step is relevant and will help achieve the outcome, you'll have an easier time training employees from that policy and procedure. So speaking of training, uh, Michelle is actually going to take us into employee training from here, and I will pass it over to her. Perfect, Jennifer. Thank you so much. So um, now you have written and approved your policies and procedures. So let's take a look at those next steps. The first thing that you want to do is make sure that your employees are trained. Uh, remember that the procedures are step-by-step -step instructions for routine tasks and operations. So if the policies and procedures are written well, this will be all that you need to train your employees to do their job. But also keep in mind that you don't have to train employees on every single policy and procedure written. You only wanna train on those that are relevant to the employee and to their job. So for example, do all employees need to know about risk assessments? No, probably not. But do all employees need to know about the organization's code of conduct, which includes expected and prohibitive behaviors and business practices? Definitely yes. You also want to be clear on which policies and procedures need to be memorized versus those that just can be read and then pulled up later as a reference. An example here uh, would be the procedure to follow for calls uh, where there's situations that uh, pose an immediate threat to the health or safety of the patient. You would want employees to have those procedures memorized so that they can handle them efficiently in the moment. But knowing that consumer materials such as the welcome packet are required to be in plain language and the guidelines that are used to write materials in plain language, that's something that probably could be read and then made available as a reference if needed. Next slide, please. Then you have the maintenance of the organization's policies and procedures. It's good to think of your policies and procedures as living documents. They need to adapt and grow with your organization. As a general rule, you want to review your policies every one to three years. The Year Act standards require them to be re reviewed and approved at least every 36 months. But if your policy is more stringent, reviewers will look to see that you are following your policy. You also want to be reviewing your policies continuously. If there is an organizational change, uh, if there's changes to laws and regulations, or if an incident or policy violation occurs, you want to use that opportunity to review your policy to make sure that it's up to date. Questions to consider are, does the policy still have its intended effect? Are there any gaps in the policy? And then just keep in mind, best practice is to make changes to your policies and procedures before the process changes, rather than changing the procedure and then updating the policy. Also, when you gather input for policy changes, uh, be sure to consult those that are experts on the topic. Uh, you would not want someone from your IT department writing policies and procedures on safe handling of hazardous medications. And likewise, most of us are medical professionals and not IT experts. So lean on that team, have them help you with those policies concerning risk assessments and security of personal health information. They're a great tool for you. Uh, also consider speaking to your staff and review suggestions from cu customers. Those uh, employees and staff members are, I mean, uh, customers through satisfaction surveys, even complaints can be very helpful as well to look at your uh, policies. After the policy has been reviewed and approved, you want to make sure that changes are communicated with your employees. I think of this as a cycle. Review, refine, train, repeat. So review your policy and procedure. Refine it to what it needs to be, those updates, what it needs to be. Train your employees and then repeat. Review, refine, train, and repeat. 
And lastly, uh, you want to make sure that the master list is updated. Uh, Jen talked a little bit about that, but uh, updating that ma master list will help you keep organized. It'll have those review dates, effective dates, and approval authority on there for you as well. Michelle, there's something there's something really interesting here about going back to the staff um, with the procedures, because it's one thing when administrators write the policies and the procedures, but it's another thing to do that check in with the staff to say, does this actually work? And is this how you're actually doing this? Is this how you're completing a process? Is this how you're fulfilling a prescription? Is this how you're contacting a provider's office and to say what's actually working and where are the opportunities to tweak it? Mm -hmm. I totally agree because they're involved in that day-to-day -day process and so they're a great asset to help you. Perfect. All right, so this slide is a quick reference for you with some do's and don'ts. Uh, let's start off with the don'ts. Uh, you don't want to forget to review your policies and procedures at least every 36 months to the month and update that review date. Uh, I did want to mention, uh, as this is often misunderstood, the effective date pertains to the initial implementation of policies and procedures, as well as the implementation of any subsequent changes. If no changes are made, the effective date remains the same. However, the review date is updated. So I like to think of it this way. The review date is always going to change when you're reviewing your policy. You're always going to update that. The effective date will only change if there are updates to the actual policy. Another thing is that you don't uh, want to create a new policy for accreditation if your organization already has an existing policy on the topic. I always say work smarter, not harder, and don't try to recreate something that's already been made. Along that same line, don't create and use policies and procedures that are not relevant to your organization. Ask yourself, does this portray your organization's mission and objectives? The answer should be yes every time. And lastly, don't write in a language that is difficult to understand. Use clear and cl concise wording um, and make sure that the process is easy to understand so those employees know what is expected of them. In looking at the dues, uh, you want to have policies that reflect your organization's goals, priorities, and workflows. You do want to use external documents to supplement your policies and procedures. These could be workflow documents, such as how to properly pack a box for shipping, or even standards of practice, such as the quality management plan, or even lists. Uh, think of things that may change frequently. You can have lists as well. You also want to be clear so that employees know what is expected of them. You want to eliminate the guesswork. And lastly, make the policy and procedure as flexible as, po as possible while producing the desired outcome. You want a good balance of rules to eliminate risk for your organization with enough flexibility to encourage skill development, growth, and natural talents. Next slide, please, Lisa. So Michelle, before you go into this next slide, you're about to talk about some UREC specific hint, tips and hints. And we saw that a, over 50% of our attendees here today are actually UREC clients who've been through the accreditation process once. So I put this in the chat, but I'm gonna say it out loud as well. If you are a UREC accreditation, what kind of one tip helped you be successful? Um, this is not us giving advice, obviously, but I see some of you, I know some names on there. I'm not gonna call them out. Um, but if you were successful as a client, what, what kind of one thing was a super helpful tip? So chime that in the chat box, because it's always great to hear from you. And we know that, at UREC, you telling us what helped actually makes us be better for you. So it's exciting to see. So um, please chime that in the chat box, just one thing. Um, and you know, for that person who's just getting started, maybe hopefully you'll get something new out of this. Mm -hmm. I love that too, learning from each other. That's always helpful. 
So like you said, this is uh, looking at some tips that are UREX specific. Uh, the first one there are is rear accreditations are more difficult because of the document upkeep, which includes those policies and procedures. I always like to say that the desktop review is the applicant's opportunity to show UREX that they're meeting the intent of the standards through their policies and procedures and then other documentation that's provided. And then the validation review that uh, Jeff referenced early on is the applicant's opportunity to show UREC that they're following those policies and procedures. So with initial accreditation, you have that shortened timeline. You just applied, it's a few months, and then you have the validation review. When you're applying for your reaccreditation, it's been three years. So that's why it's so important to review your policies. Know those standards that drive your daily processes and ensure that you're following those procedures. Not following procedures can lead to an undesired outcome for the validation review. I know the slide, it says fatal, but I prefer undesired outcome. <laughs> Um, also, your act does not expect you to have a separate policy and procedure for each standard. Uh, keep in mind that one policy and procedure may address multiple standards. I see this a lot of times with standards that cover regulatory compliance, privacy and security of consumer health information and ethics. So a lot of times that's all covered in one policy or it may even be two policies, but they don't have an each a, a policy for each individual standard. You can, but it's not required. Uh, also, please make sure that you read every policy and procedure that you submit to ensure that it's meeting the intent of the standard. I also recommend that you use the guide for your specific program as a reference. The interpretive information in the guide has very detailed information that can help you tremendously as you're writing your policies and procedures. And lastly, as reviewers, uh, as we're reading through your policies, we are thinking, if I was an employee, would I understand that process? Would I know what is expected of me? as far as behavior and even business-wise. So that keep that in mind, reread your policies and procedures. Do you have a clear understanding of what is expected of you? Um, would an employee, when they read that policy and procedure, be able to perform their job? Would they know what to do? All right, next slide. Michelle, Jennifer um, Dressler put in a great comment here. Um, she said her tip for success is have a cross-reference Excel sheet where you can track the policy to each standard and element that they satisfy by name. She said it makes finding the documents to update due to standard change so much easier, as well as how many documents are connected with that one element. It's that um, note on the bottom left of the current slide of, we don't expect you to have a separate policy because one policy that you have may actually apply in several cases. And it sounds like Jennifer is living that um, in her organization. So if others have tips like that, or if you agree with Jennifer, if you do something similar, um, feel free to chime in here. Um, here's another one. Plagiarism is the highest form of flattery. It is, I read that cautiously. Um, Yurek is very happy to see their exact verbiage from the guide saying, like, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of teeter around that, but we want to, we want to make sure that you are meeting the intent of the standard again in a way that works for you. Um, you know, and when we come to do the review, we really are looking at how are you doing your work? When Michelle, you're in there, you and Jennifer are in there doing the reviews, we're looking at how is this actually playing out? Um, that goes to the top right there of not following procedures submitted on desktop review. We want to make sure that what you tell us on desktop review, when we come to see you, whether it's virtual or on site, you're actually doing that in the validation review. Um, I see some other chats coming in, Michelle, and I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay, perfect. So these are actually some tips from the reviewers to help you succeed as well. Uh, one of them is quality is more important than quantity. And I guess just to kind of touch on the comment about um, 
basically just re reiterating what the standard says, I am personally looking for processes. The standards themselves require processes. So it's not good enough just to say that you're doing something. Explain the how. How are you doing that? Include that process in your policies. Um, another is review for improvements continuously. This is especially important when applying for reaccreditation. You want to look for those standards that have been updated and make sure that your policy reflects those updates and changes to meet the intent of the standard. Another one that's not on here is don't be afraid to do a little research. I know when I was on your side writing those policies and procedures for accreditation, it was a bit overwhelming. And I didn't know what a risk assessment was or what a firewall was or what USP 659 was. So one thing I would tell you is it's okay to not know when you're first looking at the standards use that as an opportunity for personal growth, you'd be surprised at how smart Google is. Just like Jen said, don't be afraid to look things up. And then also don't be afraid to ask questions. Reviewers have a wealth of information ready to share. Jeff talked about the client portal. There's a place in there for you to ask questions and those questions come directly to the URAC reviewers. We can't determine if something is compliant or not, but we can give guidance on the intent of the standards and even possibly offer some suggestions on how to demonstrate compliance. Jen, what tips do you have from the reviewers? So I'm, I'm actually gonna take one of these ones off of here as well. Um, and it's two in one, so it's the top ones. Um, you know, own your policies and procedures. Again, I'm gonna go back to only you can tell us what you do, nobody else. And so you need to understand everything that's in those policies and procedures and how it relates to your own practices. Um, just really make sure that you know you understand every word that is in your in your policy and pro procedure, um, and that you own those practices and you own that that policy fully. Um, so as we're finishing up this um, this section, we do want to make sure that we pull up the standard. Um, so Lisa, I'm going to have you yeah, pull up the standards. Um, so I want to, first of all, say there are two standards that we're working under. Um, so if you are in one of our programs that was um, revised or new prior to 2021, more than likely the standard that you are held accountable to is on the right hand side. Um, so you're going to have the maintains and complies uh, review of at least every 36 months, some maybe every 12 months or annually, depending on the version or the program that you're under. Um, we do have the maintain staff access to a master list in there, and then, you know, documentation of the dates and identification and approval authority. So those are that standard is going to be applicable to programs that were revised or sim, a very similar standard, um, revised or new prior to 2021. Starting in 2021, we moved over to the left-hand side. So this is the, the standard that is either in programs revised or new in 2021 or later, or coming out um, either this year or or future, um, and we do have some revisions that are happening this year. So, um, and so the different, the major difference, the main thing that um, I really want to pull out here is that the the biggest focus for us was actually moving away from a master list, a a specific master list, into making sure that staff really get the information for policies and procedures. Um, so maintain staff access to a master list, not exactly the same as disseminates new changed or update policy and procedure, but it the, the disseminates new changed or updated policies and procedures help make sure that the staff really get that information. We saw that organizations and as things are changing and moving and always updating in our world, um, we saw organizations that were moving towards 
less Excel spreadsheets and more maybe knowledge management softwares or other, other ways of documenting and maintaining their policies and procedures. And um, that term master list may not be 100% accurate, but in the end, staff need to know when new changed or updated policies and procedures happen. Jen, just a note on this slide, I think you can even see from the part on the right to the part on the left, where we're constantly asking our organizations who are applying for accreditation to improve and to show us how you're getting better over time, you can see that we're doing it on the left-hand side and that we're constantly trying to make things easier for you. This is what we talk about when we say we're streamlining the standards. We're making it easier based on how you and your organization does business. So you'll see this coming along if you're in um, a program that's before 2021, you'll see this in your next round. You'll see some simplified standards. Hopefully we're making it easier for you um, to do things like upload fewer documents when you need to and point to certain things. So it's just one of the ways we're working for you. Um, we're very close to done. So I do wanna make sure people know that they can ask questions in the chat box. Um, our team members have put in their contact information. We've shared a bunch of links in there already. Um, Jen, we've got your references up here. Yeah, and so yep. I, before we dive off of this, so, you know, we, we definitely went and did a whole bunch of research on our own um, on what are some of the things that are out there that talk about policies and procedures, how to write them, what are the importance of policies and procedures, um, you know, how do you write it, how do you write a policy and procedure, all those things. Um, the, you know, all, all of the references that we used, we threw on this slide, um, and all of them are still out there and active. We did double check that. Um, but this is not a comprehensive list by any means at all. <laughs> um, and, and in the end, this was just for us to be able to pull some things together and help you just think about how are we going to put our policies and procedures together and how are we going to make them comprehensive and yet flexible and how are we going to help our employees understand what's expected of them. This is, again, not a comprehensive list. So really make sure that you are doing what works for you and what your employees will understand so that you can keep moving forward with your actual business functions. I've got some questions coming in here. Um, and for those of you who are asking individual questions, um, they're really specific to your situation. So what we're gonna do is take your names and your client relations manager or one of the members of our review team will get back to you within about the next 48 hours. Um, we know some of you are health plans and are coming and seeing that. So we wanna just make sure that we get you the right question that's right for your organization. Um, you can see Derek chimed in and said to please email um, your client relations manager your client relations at urac.org or the individual person with whom you speak. Um, I do see the question here looking at the standards in the store, Jeff Carr chatted in the store, um, the difference between specialty pharmacy and specialty pharmacy services. Those are actually two different programs that we offer. Jen, do you have a one-liner you can give on that? Yeah, so if you are unsure about which one is applicable to you, you are probably a specialty pharmacy not a specialty pharmacy services. <laughs> um, the specialty pharmacy is the one that actually does the, the dispensing and the, the work with the patient directly on the medication. Specialty pharmacy services is there to support those organizations. And Jennifer, we'll have um, one of our team members, probably Greg McCray, get back, get in touch with you directly to help you figure out, make sure we know which program is right for you and he'll be able to get you in that right spot. And Heather Bonome, our director of pharmacy, even chimed in. I went to Jen. I really could have just gone to Heather right there. Um, Michelle and Jen, you already did this, but with kind of like one minute left to go so we can get any last questions in. Um, what one last tip do you have? What's something that you're hearing here that like, you just want people to know if you do nothing else, do this. Um, and Jen, I'm going to ask you to start. So I uh, I keep going back to it. I know I keep going back to it, but really the, just make sure that you, as, as a person who is writing policies and procedures, 
that you are owning all of those words. So use the resources that are available to you, 100%. It, there are tons of resources out there. Just really make sure that you're owning everything that ends up being a final product. And I think I would just add on to that. Um, own those policies and procedures and make sure that you're following through and know those basic policies and procedures that apply to the standards. So that as reviewers, when we ask you and your employees about them, they're aware of those standards and know those processes and, and know what they're supposed to do. Um, another thing, Lisa, if I could just, can I chime in and Abs answer Shelly's question? I yes, saw yes, Shelly yes. had a question about the change to at least 36 month review of policies. And she was asking, is the 36 months to the month as noted on the right-hand side and um, that they're used to the annual um, to the month. So it's a big change. So the answer is yes, that it is 36 months to the month. Uh, just remember, as I stated earlier, if your policy is more stringent, such as if it still states that you're going to review them annual, annually, then we will look for that, um, that you're following your policies and procedures. So if your policy says annually, we'll look for that. If your policy says every 36 months, then look for that. So that's my final final tip was, you know, look for those changes in the updated standards and make sure that your policies reflect that, any changes that you want to make to them. Michelle and Jen and Jeff, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you to the almost 200 of you who were in the room today. Um, Heather Bonomi is chatting. And if you're a current client, you can access our webinars and all of the resources available to you on our client portal. If you are not a current client, we hope that you'll connect with us, um, connect with one of our business development representatives to get you in the right place and in the right program. If you're ready, maybe you're ready now, maybe you say, we're just thinking about this, but we're not quite ready now. And that's okay. We still want to open the door to a conversation with you. Thank you so much and have a great day.